Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's edition of the Lashing Out Podcast and Nittany Sports Now Network. I'm Jared Pregore. He's Kevin Quigley. Kevin, we are back. It has been a wild offseason for both of us between work and school and play and everything. But we are finally back together once again, and it feels pretty damn good. Yeah, sorry about that. It's been nearly a month since we've 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 spoke together, um, but a lot's happened, and I'm I'm excited. We have a big show planned tonight, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. That's right. If you're if you're new to everything, we talk about Penn State football. We talk about basketball. And we'll talk a little bit about wrestling and college football as a whole. But let's get to to Mike Rhodes. Um, Penn State's basketball season is is finished. Um, Last year, it was a very different conversation that we were having about Penn State basketball. But I think Penn State as a program is infinitely better off currently than what they were even just last year. I know they went on a little bit of a run there, and it was great to see. Obviously, having having winning winning tor- tourney games is, is great. But what they did this year, I think, is the foundation to what could be a, a, a lot of success moving forward. Is that a national title? Probably not. But the foundation is there to be a successful basketball program down the road. Yeah, last year, last year it didn't feel sustainable. It felt like a tower built out of raw spaghetti and marshmallows or gumdrops. If you ever did that, um, maybe that's just engineering kids that did that in ninth grade. But um, like last year, it, my, the NIL conversation was going around our program. Micah Shrewsbury was very vocal in saying, you know, we don't have the support that we need here, and we kind of thought maybe he would stick around because it sounded like Penn state was getting this collective together. Uh, Penn state went on the run. They made it to the sweet 16. Um, ultimately losing that. So, I mean, we would have two more weeks of basketball talk if this was last year, but ultimately Shrewsbury leaves, takes the entire program with him or they transfer out, take away the program's future as the entire recruiting class, uh, including his son and his son's two friends. Um, left to go to Notre Dame. We we see how well Notre Dame this year did this year versus how well Penn State did this year. And all of a sudden Mike Rhodes comes to town. It's like, what's this guy gonna do? What's I mean he's been at VCU, uh, I forget where he was before that, but very successful at VCU. VCU is a very small school. It's just down the road from me. Um has gone to a final four in basketball, but that was Shaka Smart. He's now at Marquette and has been at Marquette for six, eight years now, it seems like at least. So Mike Rhodes kind of brought the program back and he wants to be at Penn State. Michael Shrewsbury didn't feel like he wanted to be at Penn State. It was always, there was one excuse that like he could always just keep finding of why he was going to leave Penn State. Rhodes wants to be here. And the job that Mike Rhodes did this year is just absolutely incredible. The only person who returned from the roster Last year was Kanye Clary. He gets to missed half, dismissed halfway through the season this year. So he has 0% of the minutes from last year's program. Builds this entire team from the transfer portal. Hopefully he can do something like that next year because a lot of this team was old and seniors and are out of eligibility. But what he was able to string together from what mid-April last year to now, and were they a tournament team this year? Absolutely not. Could they have gone to the NIT? I, I think so. Do, do, do they need to go to the NIT this year? No, probably not. But what he's done is it's just incredible. Because you and I, I don't know how you felt. Ex- I don't know if we ever talked about this specifically. But like I kind of wrote him off. I kind of wrote off Penn State basketball. It's like last year's just a one-off. It's going to go back to normal. It's going to be back to like the promises of Pat Chambers and everybody before him. And it's like. Maybe Penn State makes the tournament once every 10 years, but this this just feels sustainable. And like honestly, like hats off to Mike Rhodes. Like, what a job you did, man. Like Penn State's becoming a basketball school. Yeah, and I think that's the big thing. I, you know, we talk a lot of a lot of um it, it's just one of those situations where there's just so much that can happen. You know, obviously it is phenomenal that he was capable of putting a team together and they had a lot of decent success. You know, it, it, it's not one of those situations where he, they were just such a bad team when that's the opposite. You know, they, they had, 
they were very inconsistent. You know, they were either on their game or they were not. You know, Ace Baldwin Jr. was incredible. Um, obviously, there was a lot to be desired with Puff Johnson um, and, and guys like that. But the fact of the matter is he was willing and did cut Kanye Clary, their best player. He was by far one of their best players, if not their best players at the time. And with that, one of those situations where, like, that can go either way. But that brought – I thought the team played a lot better after that happened. And when that's the case, you know, you see what – you see what happens. And, you know, it, it's just one of those situations where now, you know, they are in a position for success down the road. If they kept Clary, I don't know that that's going to be a situation where things are, are, are great down the line. And, and I just don't know um, – you know, what, what would have been the case there? And, you know, fortunately for him, he was willing and able to do that. And that's, that's a lot from a, from a first year head coach. Yeah. And you could tell that guys just bought into Mike Rhodes. Mike Rhodes style requires a lot of effort, a lot of oxygen because you have to play defense and the whole timeline, anytime Penn state had the ball, everybody on the sideline had their hands up, like, Mike Rhodes' expectation on defense is like a middle school basketball team. We're going to play defense with our hands up. You're going to clog every passing lane with your length, with your hands, with your movement. We're going to double the ball at all times. There will be a man open, but we're going to rotate. And it's a very complicated system. It's not something that is plug and play. I, I don't know basketball, but I can tell like if you're switching and rotating and then you're doing all of these things that Mike Rhodes expected on defense, like that's that's not elementary middle school basketball, which is about where my knowledge of basketball stopped. Right. <laughs> I I played church league basketball for two years when I was in like fifth or sixth grade. Like that's that's my extent of basketball. But I just remember my coach always telling me, like, keep your hands up on defense and clog passing lanes. And like that's how Mike Rhodes coached. And when the team was on, they could be anybody. They beat Wisconsin, mm-hmm. they beat Illinois when they were, what, 11 and 12, I think, 2-0 and against Indiana. And not that Indiana had the greatest season this year, but when's the last time Penn State went 2-0 and against Indiana? I don't know if they've ever gone 2-0 and against Indiana because Indiana's always been good and Penn State's always been bad. And it's, what, Mike Rose has, I think, the sixth ranked recruiting class in the Big Ten coming in. The second time in program history, they have a top 100 recruit. Miles Goodman signed, has signed his national letter of intent, so he will be on campus next year. Top 100 recruit, second highest ranked recruit of all time for Penn State basketball. And Hudson Ward, who's not signed his letter of intent, I think is like fourth or fifth all time Penn State recruit. Like, When is Penn State doing that after a losing season? Or are they 500? They go 16 and 16? I can't remember the record off the top of my head, but like the records are relevant. Like this season didn't matter if Mike Rhodes didn't perform and he performed well beyond any level of expectation. And you could tell by my rambling, like just how excited I am for it. Like I I couldn't watch the first like three or four weeks of Penn state basketball. I couldn't care less. And then I started watching it. And I'm like, Oh, he cares. And this team cares. And Ace Baldwin Jr. can come back next year. He has not exhausted his eligibility. I don't know what his draft prospects are, but do you want to go, I don't want to say rot in the G League, but do you want to go rot in the G League for three or four years? Or do you want to run it back with Penn State for one more year and build up build up more of a resume, show that you can do it at many well, different He was programs. Big Ten Player of the Year defensively, and that's that's no easy task for, um, for a guy of, coming from VCU in his first year of Big Ten basketball. Yeah, back-to-back, back, right? Mm-hmm. Big Ten player of the year or defensive player of the year and then A-10 defensive player of the year the year before. So, like, guys building a resume, run it back for a third time. Maybe instead of being third team all Big Ten, he's second or first team all Big Ten next year. You know what I mean? Like, Because mm-hmm. he kind of had to share minutes and had to share the ball with Kanye Clary, and Kanye Clary was having a good season until he got hurt. And... How the team handled that, I mean, that's a lot of adversity. So I, it's just hats off to Mike Rhodes. Like, 
Mike Rhodes, if you're ever back in Richmond, like I, I owe you several, several beers at this point in time. Like it's, it's just incredible. Yeah. And, and I think he did a great job. I think there's so much more. Um, so it, it's going to be one of those situations where we're able to just now see what's going on and see how he molds things outside of the portal. And I think that's, you know, that's going to be one of the crazier things. But when we come back for the second segment of the Lashing Out podcast, we're going to talk a little bit more about a, a program that hasn't ever really had to deal with these problems uh, in the Pest State Wrestling Program when we come back after this break. Welcome back to the second segment of the Lashing Out podcast and the Esports Now Network. He's Kevin. I'm Jared. Kevin, we talked about Penn State basketball. Penn State basketball has historically been mediocre or worse than mediocre. But a team that has been the most impressive dynasty, I think, in college sports and even sports in general of late is, in fact, Penn State wrestling. Thursday kicks off the NCAA wrestling tournament in Kansas City, Missouri. And it's going to be another big year for for the Nittany Lions. They already ran, they already won the Big Ten championship very easily, and they are in a very good position to to win their third NCAA wrestling championship in a row. Yeah, and it'll be Kale Sanderson's eleventh national championship overall. Uh, he's been there fifteen seasons. Uh, that's a pretty good pretty good win loss record in terms of national championships versus not. Um, three freshmen are in the NCAAs and seeded Braden Davis at 125, Tyler Kasak at 149, and Mitchell Messenbrink, who is a redshirt freshman at 165. Uh, uh, Bo Bartlett is, what, 141. He was ranked number one all season long. He lost in the Big Tens um, to Ohio State's Jesse Mendez. Um, so he's seeded number two, but he's only lost once all season. Um, and then the big storylines are Aaron Brooks and Carter Starachi are going for their fourth national title overall. Um, four times in college is four national championships. Um, but the main story is how healthy is Carter Starachi? Can he can he win his fourth um, coming off that knee injury? Right, and, and, and I think that's the storyline coming into this is he only has two losses and they were both injury defaults at Big Tens. Um, and, and listen, he's a competitor. You saw the, the, the random messages on Twitter where, uh, what have you, right? You know, wasn't quite sure, weren't, weren't quite sure what was going on with him, right? But despite that, he is still the nine seed. Um, so he's got a lot of, lot more work to do than, than normal, than he normally would. But again, this is, I think, where it's going to be, where it's going to be fun to watch because this is something we haven't really seen from from Sirachi. He's always been so dominant, right? But he's going to have a, a, a good good opportunity to to do some work here, you know, and and kind of just looking over um, looking over the bracket here, he he gets um, Andrew Sparks out of Minnesota, uh, who's 10 and seven and in his first match. Um, and then, you know, in the quarterfinals, he'll face the number one seed. And that's not an easy situation to be in if, if he gets to there and is is um, is undefeated, right? You know, obviously you expect him to go out and win. Um, then he'll face uh, either the eighth seed or the 25 seed and Braden Thompson, who's 25 out of OK State, um, or, or Adam Kemp but out of Cal Poly. But, you know, it, it, it's just one of those situations where – we get to see him do a lot, a lot of work, and that's you know unique um, for a lot of Penn State athletes at, at national championships. But for anybody that that I think is up to the challenge, it is certainly um, Starachi. Yeah, so hopefully, hopefully he's healthy. Um, being the ninth seed, you know, you are you are in the stacked bracket, um, being not the number one, not being a top seed in the bracket. So. Um, He'll certainly have some adversity to overcome. And, man, if he's healthy, I'd hate to be the one seed losing in the quarterfinals to, to Carter Starachi. I mean, that's that's a tough pill to swallow because now you're wrestling for, at best, what, eighth place, um, sixth place, something like that. So 
or I guess you can wrestle up to fifth place if you're in the court, losing the quarterfinals, but to be the number one overall seed and have a, and you're potentially staring a fifth to eighth place in national championships, um, probably not what you want um, for, for that guy, but you know, hopefully he's healthy and it seems like Penn state, they've got somebody representing every weight class um, at the tournament. So, you know, it's go time and sounds like fourth, four in a row and, 11th overall for uh, Kale and 13th overall for the, for the program is, is well within reach. And that's the thing too. I mean, you've got at 125, you got Braden Davis who's 20 and two at 133. You've got Aaron Nagal who's 14 and five. Um, Bo Bartlett at 141, 19 and one with that lone loss coming in the big 10. He's going to be hungry. You know, that Tyler Cassack, uh, 17 and four at 149, Levi Haynes at 157. Who's undefeated. He's been a monster. Uh, 165. You got Mitchell Messenbrink, the redshirt freshman. He's 22 and 0. Um, he's had an incredible run here. You got Starachi at 12 and 2. Bernie Truax at 14 and 4 at 184. Uh, and then at 197, you got Aaron Brooks, 17 and 0. And at 285, at heavyweight, you've got Kurt Viet, um at 15 and 0. They've got a lot of a lot of dogs, man. You know, it, it's very rare that you see one, two, three, four, four guys that are undefeated. Um, and honestly, I'm going to throw Starachi in at, at undefeated as well, solely because the injury was nothing of his doing. But when he's on the mat, uh, he has not lost yet this year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how hungry they are and, and to see if they can return that national championship uh, back to Happy Valley. But in, the, in terms of the, the, the whole picture uh, with, the, with the Penn State wrestling program, um, number one, they were able to get Kale Sanderson away from his – uh, alma mater at Iowa State, uh, and the Iowa State and the state of Iowa, are, they might not be great at offensive football, but they sure can wrestle. And you know, to to get a guy uh, of Kale Sanderson's caliber uh, to come to Happy Valley and, and Central Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania as a whole is a great wrestling state for sure. But they've provided him with resources that he wants and needs, and it has paid off in in a big way. And, and we're witnessing. Uh, one of the greatest dynasties of all time in sports, and it's and it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. Kevin, as per tradition, you are muted. Yep, um, that's on me. Uh, yeah, you know, props to Kale Sanderson. Props to his commitment to the university and his commitment to the program. So. You know, the fact that he's been here 15 seasons, you know, he is he was pulled away from his alma mater and, you know, his alma mater is doing well in the wrestling world. So it's it's not like he couldn't go back and continue that success. And with. With the history of the transfer portal now being an open market in NIL, like any any program could come snatch him. And it seems like Penn State has done the job that they need to keep him happy and to keep the program running. And as as long as he keeps winning there, he's going to have a job. Right. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. But you mentioned being happy, Kevin. And the best way to keep a lot of people happy in college football and college sports right now um, is money. So we're going to talk a little bit more about money when we come back for the third and final segment of the Lashing Out Podcast on the Sports Now Network. Welcome back to the third and final segment of the Lashing Out Podcast on the Sports Now Network. I'm Jared. He's Kevin. Kevin, you know, there seems to be a lot of money going around. It's not coming into my pocket, clearly, or maybe it's not even coming into your pocket. But college football and ESPN signed another multi-billion dollar media rights deal, $1.3 billion to be exact. The rich get richer. And the ACC is now out on an island. And I mentioned this ACC because they get one of the smallest shares as per this deal. Yeah, and so the six-year, $7.8 billion contract ensures that ESPN um, is the sole heir of the college football playoff, which means our cable bills cable bills will go up by about $5 each. Everybody, uh, this is what happens when the TV deals sign, uh, because ESPN doesn't know how to run their own business. Um, but that's my rant on ESPN. Uh, yes, like you said, the ACC, there's, the two other conferences don't matter at this point in time. The Pac-4. It's the Pac-4. Uh, the Big 12 
is irrelevant now that Texas and Oklahoma have left. Um, it's the SEC, it's the Big Ten, and it's what will soon be left of the ACC. Um, if you're a Big Ten and SEC program, you get $21 million more annually per the new deal. Um, you're going to have two automatic bids, if I memory serves me correctly, um, into the tournament. And, uh, oh yeah, that's $13 million more a year uh, than your ACC counterparts. So Clemson and Florida State, why they're trying to leave the ACC for $13 million a year, I'm not sure. Because if you stay in the ACC and you win it every year, like you virtually already do, um, you get the mega payout from actually being in the college football playoff, which is more than enough to offset the $13 million annually that you'd be losing from just being in the ACC. However, like, so why would you want to go to the Big Ten or the SEC and get your ass kicked and then fighting and scrounging to be Big Ten champion or SEC champion when you can just mail it in the ACC? If no one leaves, it all stays status quo and you make more than $13 million going to the college football playoff. You do. For just existing in the Big Ten and SEC, you make $21 yeah. million. Dollars for no, that was school. the raise. That was the raise. Yes. Yeah. It was an so increase of. On, right. On an annual basis, the Big Ten and SEC schools will each make more than $21 million, which is 13 plus, or I'm sorry, 16 million more than what they make now. Because they start or they're around, right around 5.5 million for schools in power five conferences, right? So when you look at the ACC, why not go to greener pastures? Cause you can get more money because this is just the college football playoff. This is not the basic media rights deals from Fox, from CBS, from ESPN. Well, this is ESPN, but, but from those, right? So like they're going to make even more money just to exist. So yeah, why not go there? Of course, you know, <laughs> Oregon State and Washington State are currently independent schools <laughs> or, or being or treated as independents. Um, but even, you know, look at Notre Dame, for example. They're going to be making more than what ACC schools will be making, more than likely. So maybe if and if not, it's still pretty close. Um, so like that is, you know, if you're Notre Dame, why would you why would you enter a conference? Why why now? Because you're double dipping. You're getting your NBC money. You're getting this money. Like you don't really need a conference. But if the ACC folds, I'm not necessarily saying they're going to fold, but that with these schools, it's going to be a rat race. And it's now, and you can say power five all you want. It's now power four. But it's a heavy two, in my opinion, with the SEC and the Big Ten. It's it's very much a heavy two. And I, I did forget that uh, they are projecting the Big Ten with its mega TV deals that it signed last year is projected to distribute between 80 and and $100 million a year to each of the current 16 members. Obviously, that will get diluted if Clemson joins, but uh, ACC money is only about forty million dollars as of a couple of years ago. So, and that subsidizes your athletic department. It does. I mean, like, it does. But I mean, going to the national, like the college football playoff, you're if you win your conference, you guarantee you have a home game. You don't think Clemson wants a home game in Death Valley? I mean, oh, I'm not saying what, that they don't. What yeah. that does to the town, like I don't know. I'm not saying Death like, Valley is a much better place to play in November than. Piscataway, New Jersey. Uh, let's be real. Piscataway, never, New Jersey will never host a college football playoff game. Um, I might. But no. Greg Schiano would like to have a word. R- Rockers will never make me eat my words on that one. Um, but, like, I'm not saying you leave the ACC, but, like, the amount of hassle you're going to have to go to, Florida State staring at a $585 million exit fee from the ACC, uh, which they're currently suing the ACC over. Um, Clemson, yeah, there are now two lawsuits against the ACC. Yes, Clemson just filed their lawsuit, and from what I think it was Pete Thamel that was reporting it, is that Penn, uh, Clemson was all up in the business of the ACC. Like, they were spending days at the ACC office, 
like photocopying the agreement and why they didn't have it on their campus. I don't know, but like photocopying the agreement and like really getting on the ins and outs. And right now Clemson's exit fee for some reason is only 140 million versus Florida States, I think is what Clemson's trying to sue over. I mean, 140 million. Um, But they're saying that they would not, basically what they're trying to say is that it's 140 million to leave the conference, which they don't see that as being like legitimate. And then they're trying to sue that the grant of rights that the ACC made them sign is not enforceable because once they leave the conference, they would no longer be entitled to paying the ACC for the lack of revenue that Clemson would leave behind or something along those lines. So two massive lawsuits against this conference, you know, the conference is going to have, lawyers well in excess of two thousand dollars an hour i mean just some absurd number legal fees to go along with it and if you're the university you're probably forking up 30 40 50 million dollars in legal fees and time to then potentially still have to pay half a billion dollars to leave this conference half a billion dollars is a lot of freaking money and where's that money coming where is that money coming from the money is the money that they want for the exit fees are, are insane. And you know and, and should know how I feel about certain teams in the ACC that I'd like to come to the Big Ten. Um, but who's to say that some of these conferences aren't going to help along the way? It's a, hey, ESPN, can you help us hook us up a little bit? Like there's – which is insane to say, but like – there's – obviously there's plenty of money to go around, right? It's The Big Ten's going to get a cut too you know the sec is going to get a cut as well so like you know it, it, there's just so much money at, at stake here and it, and it's absurd it, it 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 it's wild to even consider this but i mean it'll be interesting to see who wants who and, and where and who goes where um you know who would be a great fit um in the big 10 personally i i i want the basketball aspect of it because i think you have to look at it that way we're it, it's march Right, March Madness is, is is all around us, and there's money in that too. And who's going to bring your value there? Like, you look at schools like Duke, North Carolina, obviously to say two that I'm very familiar with. Right, you know, bringing them into the Big Ten on a basketball aspect of it. Carolina football is more than holding their own right now. Duke has Manny Diaz now, obviously is familiar face to the to the Big Ten. So I mean that's two two um double-edged sword right there you know that's a two for one and you you look at clemson clemson basketball is okay um you know who would you root for though kevin if penn state and clemson were in the same conference oh dude no question you you already know the answer to that. it's penn state that's what i figured but i wanted to get it in words oh it's um, it's it's no competition but that's a, and, and it's only going to get uglier um i I'm very interested to see if this proceeds in the courts. I mean, obviously, they, there are far more important things that the courts have to be worrying about or should be worrying about than college football like this. Um, but it's one of those situations where now, you know, what happens next? Um, do those schools leave? Do they do they t- dip into certain situations and certain monies? But, you know, I would love to be a lawyer for one of these schools, though. Yeah, I mean, the paycheck they're going to be getting is absurd. But, like, not to be, like, college athletics is about the schools, about the students, about everything. But like, Certainly not about the student athletes. That's for damn sure. But I have a big problem if Florida State is able to come up with $585 million to leave the ACC along with the $30 million in legal fees that they're probably going to have. And then what's tuition going to do? I know it's, I know it's separated. But their money's going to have to come from somewhere. And if you had that $585 million laying around that you were able to do this with, why the hell is your tuition so high? I, I'm i not trying to like a – like this is kind of the money, and it's like why is college so expensive? And we love right. college athletics, but there are – you were talking about bigger things for the fish for the fish to fry in the courts. Like that's one of those things. And like I'm going to have a big issue if Florida State suddenly has – over half a billion dollars, B billion dollars to leave the ACC. Do I want to see the ACC die? Yeah, I, I absolutely hate the ACC. I think the ACC is, a delus- is full of delusional fans. Um, 
you know, will I be uh, taken out like Joan of Arc for saying that? Probably so. But I think the ACC stinks. Uh, Maryland left it for a reason. And I think Maryland stinks, too. So um, uh, seeing the demise of the ACC would bring me a lot of joy. Unfortunately, UVA and Virginia Tech would probably have to join the Big Ten at that state at that point in time, which would grind my gears to no end. Um, but yeah, UNC and Duke are probably would probably come to the Big Ten. Is Clemson coming to the Big Ten? Is Florida State coming to the Big Ten? Clemson probably has a better chance of coming, or excuse me, Florida State probably has a better chance of coming to the Big Ten than Clemson does. Um, I think Florida has a lot of pull in the SEC. Um, and Miami is going to be itching to come into the SEC as well if the ACC suddenly collapses. Um, is there room for two more Florida, Florida programs in the conference? I'm not so sure. Miami, I think, has significantly a lot more money floating around it than Florida State does, um, just because it's a private institution and uh, it's in Miami and not Tallahassee. Um, Clemson is Clemson's really close to the SEC. I mean, it's a two-hour drive to Atlanta from from Clemson. They yeah they yeah I can, they're basically. I can... Not for that. They're, they're an SEC adjacent program already. The school is very SEC vibey. Um, when I when I went there and like when I went to a football game, I mean, not that UVA doesn't do this as well, but like dudes in blazers and ties and girls in sundresses and like the bat the football game is 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 the event in the town and. The logo points to one o'clock. If you ever seen the Clemson logo, the paw print, the two middle paws point to one o'clock because that's what time college football used to kick off. Like the whole school is SEC is it's got an SEC vibe to it. I think Clemson would ultimately go to the SEC. Um, we'll see what happens, but uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of legal stuff that is well above uh, uh, an engineering educated uh, person's brain, such as myself. Um, to understand, but the best we can do is read articles and uh, interpret it the best we can. Yeah, and, and you know, to put this in perspective, I'm uh, I'm, I'm pulling this from Pete Thamel's um, piece on ESPN here. You know, how far behind is the ACC? All right, so during the 2023 fiscal year, the SEC generated 852 and a half million dollars worth of revenue. It distributed about seven hundred and forty-one million to its fourteen schools, which is an average of about fifty-one point three million per schools, after excluding bowl expenses. Okay, the Big Ten eight hundred and forty-six million in revenue for the fiscal year ending in June twenty twenty-two. It files its tax returns in May, right? So, um, you know, it, it is, we talked about the eighty to one hundred million per year to each of its sixteen members. That's from the league, the ACC. It, to its 14 full members, um, what in 2021 and 2022 was $39.4 million. Like, that's insanity compared to what the, uh, what the other schools are competing against in the ACE, in the Big Ten, in the SEC are at the moment. And, you know, that's, that's absurd. And, you know, is that obviously that's going to be a lot smaller, not a lot smaller, but it's going to be a little bit smaller, you know, when you go to other leagues or conferences or what have you. But, but right now big, the arms the big, race is nuts and, and it's only going to get worse. But if the big 10 adds like four or five teams, they're not going to renegotiate this TV deal. So it's going to be diluted. They might. Um, no. I bet you any money they could. They could, but like, but, uh, but not, same not necessarily with with CBS or I'm sorry with ESPN, but with the CBSs and the and the Foxes. NBC is probably not going to budge anymore because they're going to shove it more on Peacock. Which They'll make they will make Notre Dame join a conference. It does, but like then it's a six team in the program, right into the into the conference, and we saw it with the Pac-12. That's granted a very different situation, and now we're seeing with the ACC eight. The ACC tried to stay together. They tried to go to ESPN and said, hey, if you want this conference to stay together and you want this TV deal to stay and hold its value, uh, you're going to need to pony up some more cash to keep this conference together. And ESPN basically told them no. Kick rocks. And yeah, that's, why, pretty, pretty that's, quickly why, too. 
That's why Florida State and Clemson are trying to leave is because the ACC well, couldn't negotiate a big contract. And Florida State got screwed, right? You want to talk about – I mean, it is what it is, but, you know, they, they essentially got screwed from being an ACC team. Yeah, but then why – so why leave the ACC if starting next year the champion gets the automatic bid? They're not winning the Big Ten next year. No. Get in line. I mean – there's some dudes doing drugs who think USC is going to go 12 and 0 in the Big Ten. Uh, that was out there floating on social media this week. But uh, yeah, like get in line of. I mean, there's probably five or six programs I put above Florida State, especially because they're losing half their roster. Um, it, it, you know why? Why leave where you're going to have the gravy? Obviously, they are going to be the ACC next year. Uh, will they get the bid next year? Who knows? UNC is probably do for a downfall duke will probably rise with manny diaz being there but you have to think clemson's an improved program next year kate clubman's going into year two of his of his football career follow similar with uh drew aller second year starter so we're expecting big things out of drew i would expect clemson fans are expecting big things out of Cade. so i, I don't know the grass is greener in the big 10 in the sec but well, the grass is certainly greener than anything in the ACC. That's for damn sure. But it it, it'll be very interesting to see how this kind of um, – how this proceeds because, you know, we can sit here and debate this all, all the time, but it's, t- it's tough for any institution right now that, you know, when you look at, at the revenue sports, which we're just going to use football and basketball right now. It is the haves and the have-nots. But behind them are, are dozens of other sports that matter too. Wrestling, hockey, baseball, softball, boys and girls soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, you name it. It matters, right? So when you see this now, though, it's intense. Because let's be real. USC, and this might be a bad example, but USC coming to the Big Ten, right? So USC coming to Michigan, coming to Penn State, coming to Ohio State once or once a year in, in another sport, that's not necessarily cost efficient. What I do think that they need to do is you have the big conferences for the Big Ten and the, you know, the Big Ten SEC for footballs and basketballs, all right? For football and basketball, it keeps the same which I think they need to go to stay regional for the Olympic sports and the non-revenue sports, or it's just going to leave a lot of programs, maybe not necessarily scrape, just scraping by, but it's going to put them in a bind financially. And that's not what anybody wants out of all this, despite all the money that is going through the revenue sports. I, I think if the ACC collapses on the football front, it will be the straw that breaks the camel back to, to put the non-football and non-basketball hell even basketball might go back and the big east might become a thing again um after syracuse left and rutgers left and all those who left the big east to join other conferences for basketball maybe maybe we go to a power two for football and the traditional pre what when was the big east collapse 2010 2011 something like that around then yeah I mean, it's it's been 10, 15 years at this point in time. I guess Rutgers has been in the been in the Big Ten since Bill O'Brien, so that's twenty fourteen at least. Twenty thirteen. Twenty twelve, twenty thirteen, right? Um mm-hmm. the years are running together. Ugh. But yes. <laughs> um I I you know, it's been insanity since then. And I think, you know, if the ACC collapses on football and you literally go to two football conferences it will not be sustainable for everybody else. But then again, the, the conferences would be so big that you do get the interregional travel again uh, because right. they all dissolved into one big thing. So I think geogra- I think geography will come back into play uh, if the ACC collapses for football. Definitely right? for the other sports, especially. I mean, football can afford it barely. Not necessarily barely. I mean, they're still going to pull in a ton of money. I mean, let's talk about blue-white, right? Blue-white is April 13th, and – it's twenty dollars to park there if you don't already have a parking pass. So I mean, they are going to make plenty of money. It'll just be interesting to see, you know, what's next. And I, and I think that's the crazy thing, you know, as we wrap up here. It's 
it's just something new every day. It's a team wanting to leave. It's a team where where would they go? Where do they want to go? Who wants them, right? You know, who is who's the desirable target? Who would the Big Ten want? Do they want it? Do they want to stretch all the way down to the U and get that Miami market so that they have the four corners, right? So you'd have Pacific North Northwest, the Pacific. You'd have LA. You'd have DC. You'd have New York. You'd have that illustrious Columbus and Midwest and Detroit market, and then you can't, you know, that that Miami market. You have a stranglehold, and that's what would make the Big Ten money. That everybody's going to want to fight over the U, and the U isn't worth fighting for for football, and it hasn't been since two thousand three ish. Yeah, whatever Ed Reed left. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I. I hate to get on a high horse, but man, like all this money floating around, it's just like I just wish it would come my way, man. <laughs> yeah, start throwing some M's. So I don't even want B's. I just want M's. Uh, just give me some millions. Uh, but I mean, Penn State's got to fund what nearly a billion dollars or seven hundred fifty million for a Beaver Stadium right now. Yeah, I know. I'm excited. It, it'll be nice to, to. I love Beaver Stadium. It does look very much like an erector set, um, and I like to see the different layers of the stadium. You know that were cast at different times but you know you've been in the beaver stadium press box it's not a fun place to necessarily be when things are shaking it's like you're you're on a double wide that's on top of a double wide and you're moving and you're grooving and it's it's not a great time for sure it feels but, like a high school it feels like a high school press box with food and ice cream but the food and i, I listen if i break another spoon i'm <laughs> going to be so angry. <laughs> but before i get all flustered again uh, one game, I broke two spoons in a row. I was very not pleased, um, and I let it be known on, on the Twitter sphere back when it was still Twitter. But that's really – any parting shots before we go, Kevin? Um, no, but I uh, just want to bring back uh, Scotty Scheffler may never lose again in the golf world. So if you're a professional golfer that is listening – And we got to- Tiger action in the in the Masters. Yeah, I, I don't know if any professional golfers are listening to this, but uh, somebody go beat Scotty Scheffler. I love Scotty Scheffler. I think he's great for golf. He but, learned uh, how to putt, and that's scary. Dude, it's, it's so <laughs> scary. You and I are both golfers, so so you can appreciate that. But uh, yeah, some, somebody would. else somebody else win. I, I'm I'm all for a Tiger 2.0 dominance. He's not quite there yet, but uh, I would so, somebody's got to go beat him. Sacrifice a lot of different things just to win one PGA tournament. Um, but like. Scotty Scheffler's cat. I would I would kill to just even be his caddy right now. Eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the last two weeks for Ted Scott. Like yeah, right. I mean, that's not great this time of year, for tax season. But if you live in you know Florida, life's not too bad without income tax. No, and let's see. Last week was in Florida. Where was it the week before? Uh, so he doesn't pay, he doesn't pay income tax on the players. And then there was one in Arizona. The Scott, TBC Scottsdale was out there. They, yeah. There's no income tax out there either, I don't think. Yeah, so he's doing Here, all right. We're, we picked the wrong. We picked he's doing wrong. better than us. <laughs> yeah, so, somebody has to. <laughs> but for for Kevin for Kevin Quigley, this has been Jared Prugar. We're going to dream of greener days on the golf course where we make a lot more money than we make podcasting. But that's why we do it. It's fun. It's enjoyable. And we certainly aren't in it for the money. Let's, for Kevin, let's... this has been Jared. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, as always, for joining us on the, on the Nittany Sports Now Network.